So over the past 20 or 30 years, we have seen the human population, as you know, over the past 50 years, we've seen the human population double, about 7 billion. We're seeing pressures on natural habitats increasing <coughs> over time. The reason I went to that side of the room is because although, of course, poverty is one of the contributing factors, I didn't consider overall that it's the main factor. There will be some cases where you can argue it is, even to the people who serve did. So, poverty. When my father-in-law was a little lad in England, poverty meant your kids were going to school without any shoes on. And in England, that's cold, especially in the winter. And you didn't have enough food to put on the table, and you didn't have enough fuel to warm your house during the winter. So people were already suffering. Fortunately, things have got much better in England, but there's still a problem of poverty. But now I heard on the radio the other day, the government defines poverty as having an income that is, I think, 40% or less of the mean income of the country. And that means if the country generally gets better off and the incomes go up, then the poverty line goes up. It's not about poverty because it's a relative thing. And if poverty is a relative thing, if the poorest part of society are in poverty, then we're never going to get rid of poverty because there's always going to be a distribution curve of very rich people and very poor people and lots of middle. So, define our terms. Poverty in the sense of developing countries is like in the early part of the last century in the UK. Your kids don't have shoes, you don't money in your pocket, you can't get food to put on the table, you can't look after the necessities of life. And poverty in those circumstances, sadly, and I'm ashamed to say it as someone who's compelled to be a conservationist, I don't want to be a conservationist, I don't want to be want to do conservation. Most of you would probably just like to study the apes that we're trying to say, but while you're studying them, as I've found, if someone else comes along with their own personal poverty reduction strategy, which is kill that animal because some foreigner, not a local, will pay for the skull or the hands of the baby, then of course you're going to weigh up the risks. I'm a poor person, this guy's got lots of money, that ape is worth money to this guy, I could have some of that. And if you don't think you're going to get caught, then you have the necessary skills to track down and kill or capture the ape, then why not? So law enforcement comes in, but law enforcement that is just jackboots and guns and locking up poor people who are trying to get out of poverty is, injust is unjust. There is little justice in penalizing the people who are actually killing the apes if they have no other option. And the one thing we've learned over the past 20 or 30 years is that you have to take all these facts into account. That's why I agree with Anne that this wasn't a good statement to be discussing because there's so many ifs and buts, but I guess that was the idea to get people talking. So, if poverty varies, let's take a community that live in a, a natural forest and if you went to that community 50 years ago, they probably wouldn't have much money in their pockets. But if they were living in a natural forest, they were surrounded by wealth. Not financial wealth, but fish in the river, animals in the forest they can hunt, vegetables, fruit. Basically, they're living in abundance. And 50 years ago, they're probably quite a small community, and there would be enough. But as we all know, human numbers are rising, and we can't rely on the natural productivity of most habitats to support people. Rainforests, they reckon, support about one human per square kilometer. And there's a lot more humans out there wanting um, nutrition or other resources from the forest. So maybe it's just more efficient to convert the natural forest into oil plantations. And having just come from this meeting in Saba, where the the whole event was co-sponsored by the Malaysian uh, Palm Oil Council and, and leading some cynics to regard the whole thing as a PR exercise. Palm oil is this multi-billion dollar industry and they throw a few hundred thousand or a couple of million at conservation and that just grieves their image enough so that they can carry on converting natural forest into oil palm. But if you have a square kilometer of land in the tropics that has enough rainfall, Palm oil is the crop for you because it produces more uh, valuable product.
per unit area than any other crop. And when Johannes, my colleague from Grasp, who's also at the meeting in the summer, but he stayed at the end, I left early so I could go and talk to you. Uh, when Johannes gets here, I'm sure he'll give you uh, the rundown on the study that Grasp funded on the economics of orangutan uh, conservation and uh, sustainable forest management. It was published at the end of last year. Uh, it's a paper, a booklet really, uh, published by UNEP at the request of the Indonesian government. And the conclusion there was not only is palm oil the most profitable crop you can grow in a tropical area within a rainfall, but that it can be more profitable to leave the forest natural if you can trade the carbon as at the current price. And if carbon prices go up, as they're predicted to, um, then that obviously makes it even more profitable. And if you start to get more ecosystem services monetized, that is, everyone on the planet, as I'm sure you're aware, benefits from tropical rainforests. The way we benefit varies according to the distance we are from them, but whether you live in New York or in Jakarta or, or in Alankaraya, um, you are benefiting from tropical forests. And the role of apes in those forests, as indeed elephants and chimpanzees and tapirs and other large mammals, the fruit-eating animals play a very important role. Some of you will have heard me rattle about this ad nauseum uh, for a long time. And if you haven't, then it's even later because I'm back on about it to you too. Uh, the role of the fruit-eating mammals is essential in a tropical forest because in tropical forests, unlike those in the temperate um, parts of the world, between 75 and 95 percent of the tree species have their seeds dispersed by animals. Few have them dispersed by wind, some by water, um, floating seeds and so on, but a large proportion, depending on which forest you're in as to what the proportion is, the vast majority require animals. And, and I'm saying this in, in the sea floor, uh, which is perhaps a bad thing because I'm not a forester, but the principle is that this is co-evolution between fruit-eating animals and fruit trees. And with that point of view, the reason why apes are important to red discussions and why, in my opinion, uh, <coughs> Some of the vast sums of money that have been talked about being put on the table for red uh, should be going to ape conservation because the forests need the apes as much as the apes need the forests. And the drawback, and I hope this will be reflected in the, the opportunity we have to put out from this meeting some guidelines from policymakers, the drawback is that people who are thinking about forest conservation, particularly now that tropical forests are valued for the carbon storage and sequestration that they provide the world, um, they're valued as a collection of trees. Uh, I had a, 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 an exchange at Forest Day 3 or 4, I think which one it was, uh, the, the one in Copenhagen, uh, actually, it was in Copenhagen, uh, where a, a carbon scientist, when I asked from the floor whether they were concerned about the road back from the forest, um, she said her job was to measure the carbon and decide how much the forest stores and how that changes over time. There's more carbon or less carbon will depend on how valuable the forest is. And my response was, well, that's like weighing a car. If you weigh a car and then you take the gears out, the car weighs almost the same. But it doesn't work. And if you take the animals out of a forest, if it's a forest that depends on an animal for seed dispersal, then the next generation of trees will be affected. And you'll see, as, as studies are beginning to show, as people are studying forests that have been overhunted, the animals have been removed from the forest, the recruitment of trees is changing. And so the species composition will change. Now some botanists see a correlation between seed size and wood density. A dense tree is going to store more carbon than a light tree. That's why big, old, hardwood trees store so much more carbon than, than acacias that are growing in five years, seven years, and then harvested. So solid, dense, old trees have lots of carbon. It's taken a long time to get there, but that's like so it's standing peat swamp. <coughs> peat swamp occupies uh, is a store of thousands of years of, of uh, carbon stored underground. But in an old forest where the big trees are up to a thousand years old, 
That's been stored in carbon too. And you can't replace that forest with a new young forest and expect it to have the same amount of carbon per square kilometer. And if that forest <coughs> is in the tropics and it depends on animals, and particularly those tree species which have large seeds, obviously need large animals because small fruit eating birds can't eat large seeds. You need apes and elephants. There's another role that apes play in a forest which has not, to my knowledge, been carefully studied. But it's self-evident. When you watch an ape, I'm not saying I need my visit with ape here. This is great. I'm, I'm not superstitious, so I'm not worried about putting up an umbrella inside. But if, if you imagine this as a rainforest tree, if it's a young tree, small enough for an ape to climb and build a nest in, what happens when the ape builds a nest is that they break the branches and form a tight little ball, which is a comfortable place for an ape to spend the night. But that, of course, creates a light gap in the canopy. And if you've got a population of apes doing this all over the forest, every day, every evening, they build a nest, break off branches, form a tight little ball, that has a big impact on the structure of the canopy. For one thing, it creates little bundles of dead wood and leaves in the top of the trees. Now, to my knowledge, no one has studied the role that that plays in the distribution and number of wood boring insects. But beetles need dead wood. And in most forests, there isn't that much dead wood because it's all alive. So, so you've got animals here that are creating little pockets of dead wood. And decomposition is going on up there, probably with different species than it's going on down there. So, in terms of biodiversity, apes are doing that. But in terms of the health of the forest, when an ape builds a nest, it sleeps in the nest and digests the previous day's food, and usually during the night or first thing in the morning, they relieve themselves over the side of the nest, and the seeds fall right underneath the tree where they build the nest. And the nest has just created a light gap in the canopy. So you've got seeds which have been scarified by the chewing, have been partially digested, so the exterior coating has been reduced to the point where moisture can get in and it can germinate. It lands on the floor in a ball of dung, which then decomposes, producing a nice fertilizer, and it's under a gap in the canopy, so the light comes down and feeds that seedling. And that's why people have studied germination rates and seedling survival of trees uh, whose seeds have passed through an animal as compared to those that have just fallen on the floor under the parent plant find that much higher rates of germination from the seeds that have been chewed and dispersed. And of course with large animals they go some distance. So that problem of seeds falling not very far from the parent plant is solved by the use of animals. So you take those animals out of the forest, you're going to have a serious problem. And one of the big issues in red, one of the reasons why red was so slow to get off the ground and it's still so controversial, is Forests don't seem very permanent. If you can bulldoze a forest within a matter of months, and you can, people do, it's still arguing, how permanent is a carbon store? So what if you, if you say, okay, with, with a red, the payment is, is not for the carbon in the forest, the payment is for a promise to keep the forest and its carbon intact for 50 or 100 years. That's what you're paying for. You're paying for the storage of the carbon not the actual carbon itself. And if you're paying for that storage, you want to be sure that when old trees die and decompose, that carbon that's locked up in the leaves and branches and roots doesn't just go into the atmosphere. You want it to be captured by new trees. And if the new trees depend on seed dispersal, then you need to have a healthy forest. And this is why, in a lot of my lectures over the past few years, the, the line I've been making is that, that if Tropical rainforests of Amazonia, Africa, and Southeast Asia are essential to the health of the planet. And there seems to be general consensus that that is the case. And if apes are essential to the health of the forest, then protecting apes is not just a matter of, oh, they're rather nice species and they're rather like us and they're interesting to study and, and they're, they're fascinating, intelligent, social beings. All those are very good reasons and those are the reasons why many of us got involved in ape studies in the first place, because they are fascinating. But if they're also a, a keystone species in a habitat which is of global importance, then we should be taking them more seriously for that reason. So I hope during these days we'll be thinking a little bit about the function that red apes play in those forests.
So, for the people who were <coughs> living in the community in the forest, with an abundance of fish and uh, mammals and birds and fruit and other uh, uh, resources around them, the decline in ape numbers or other endangered species numbers that leads governments to say we want to create a national park and exclude people actually creates poverty. You take a community that had everything the community would want, except perhaps lots of money and, and modern gadgets and gizmos, but they were living a, a good life, a life that humans have been living for millennia, and suddenly somebody comes along and says, no, you have got to move to this side of the arbitrary line that we're going to draw, and on this side, it's just for nature. And suddenly you don't have access to those resources, so you have been made poor by conservation. Is there any surprise that communities like that feel pretty not about what conservation does? That's not always the case, but there are still cases of communities who have not been compensated for losing their traditional lands. And because their traditional lands go back beyond that culture's adoption of writing, there's no records, and it's very hard for them to prove, other than through oral tradition, and that's where they always lived. It's very interesting seeing what happens when you bring modern technology into those sorts of communities. GRASP um, co-sponsors the work of the Forest Peoples Program in Cameroon, and they use one of these data mappers to go around with the pigmies in the forest. This is a tree that fruits at this time of the year, and this is where the caterpillars feed, and we get lots of nutritious caterpillars from this tree. They went around the forest, and what they found was that the parts of the forest that were most prized and valuable to the pygmies were the parts of the forest where the, the highest density of gorillas and chimpanzees. So the traditional use of the forest was entirely compatible with a healthy forest with uh, chimpanzees. But what happens when pygmies' skills are utilized by a businessman who wants to sell bush meat in a town is that suddenly they're use of the forest becomes unsustainable. Or worse still, they don't use the pigmies, they bring in other hunters from town. The timber company comes in, opens up the forest, and once there's a road network in the forest, anyone can get into the middle of the forest, and there's vehicles coming back and forth, so tucking amongst the wood on vehicles, you've all seen the photographs, and maybe seen some of the interviews of the drivers. And the drivers who are driving from the forest, carrying logs, to the sawmill or to the port where they're going to be exported to Europe or, or um, Japan or where, wherever the furniture factory is. Um, the drivers say, well look, if you're driving on the road and you see a $20 bill on the side of the road, you'll stop and pick it up and put it in your pocket. And to them, driving past a dead animal that, that some hunter has stuck on a stake beside the road, it's a $20 bill. You can buy it from the, the hunter for a small price take it to the city and sell it for a higher price. Because as was observed by one of our African colleagues, it's people in the cities with money in their pockets who can afford to pay premium price for bushmeat that generates that, that trade. And once something becomes a commercial commodity, almost always what happens, if you look at the history of fisheries, and you look at the histories of, of exploitation of wild mammals, of wild birds, once it becomes a commodity and, and the market is limitless, the natural population cannot reproduce fast enough, and it starts to decline. And at some point, it will go extinct. You've all seen the pictures of, of passenger pigeons darkening the sky in the 19th century in North America, and people just shot birds in the air, and shot birds, and dead birds would fall out of the air, everyone thought they could never run out of passenger pigeons until the last one died in the zoo. So, however many the words to start with, if the offtake is so high, that is unsustainable, that population will decline, and unless some self-control comes into it, and humans are spectacularly bad at self-control, we'll try and restrain ourselves, but self-restraint is not one of our strongest points, because we tend to go for what's good for us, and not necessarily what's good for the whole um, community or for the whole planet. This matters a lot with apes, because as you're all, I'm sure, very aware, they have a very slow lifestyle low reproductive rate. And if with orangutans you've got a childhood that lasts seven or eight years, and a female is only going to produce a very small number of offspring in her life, African apes have a little shorter childhood, but still 
a very small percentage offtake of an ape population will send it into decline. And therefore, once apes become a commodity, whether it's for live babies or for dead apes, for trophies, skulls, hands, whatever the commercial value of the bit of the ape is, um, if it becomes a commodity and there's a limitless market, their numbers will decline. And we've seen it happen. And the only thing that's going to stop that is not doing something to the apes. Most conservation work, as I'm sure you're aware, is not, not doing stuff to animals. Some is. I mean, Tony helps individual animals with his effects. If they're sick and, and they need his attention, that's one thing. But mostly it's, it's keeping humans back from doing the stuff that we do that is damaging to them. And if those humans are in poverty and they don't have other options, then what are you going to say to them? Don't do that, full stop. Or don't do that because I can offer you something better. Which is one of the things that I'm, I'm very glad Gillian was here because the gorilla organization did a very um, innovative thing when it first got underway in the UK as a separate organization. It talked to the people that lived around the Durango volcanoes and asked them what they thought were the priorities. And the sort of things that they wanted was a supply of water. Lots of people walked into the park where there was a forest and shade and rain and streams to get water. And so the putting in water systems to catch rainwater off school roofs and that sort of thing helped. Um, better agricultural practices, organic agriculture. What's the gorilla organization doing teaching people about organic farming? Well, it does because it increases the, the price, it increases the output from the fields. And beekeeping, beekeeping. Beekeeping is a great thing to teach someone because there will always be a demand for honey. And bees go out and do positive things in the environment. They pollinate <coughs> the flowers. So, so giving people alternative livelihoods, this is something that WCS is doing in, in Nigeria. They're actually targeting poachers. In 2009, some of you know, I was the ambassador for the UN Year of the Gorilla. And one of the things I did was to travel across Africa uh, by public transport wherever possible, talking to people. So I, I talked to a student on a bus in Uganda, and, he, he, and you can see some of these interviews online if you put the time. Uh, the little film called State of the Gorilla Journey. And the student on the bus is called Brian, he's a college now. Um, he said, when I heard on the radio that it was a year of the gorilla, I said, I can't believe year of the gorilla. He said, it's like someone woke up and said, Brian, today is the world day for hens. And for him it was a bizarre and, and a stupid concept. But then he thought about it and realized that perhaps there was something in it. And that's particularly important for Ugandans to realize that, and Rwandans, because in the past 30 years, gorillas and their habitat have gone from being a drain on the country's economy, just another cost you have to pay, go after to protect a forest that nobody really uh, sees the value of, to being in the top three foreign exchange burdens for the country. And I, I'm sure that even the uh, Indonesian and Malaysian people here are aware of the importance of gorilla tourism, but I don't know, I was asking someone on the plane yesterday, a journalist from uh, Jakarta, whether she knew how much people paid for a ticket to go and see family of mountain gorillas. And she said, no, she didn't. I said, no, I'll take a snap. She said, $100? $500 for one hour to go and sit with the family of gorillas. And the reason it's $500, it didn't start at 500 it started with 80 and it's been creeping up every couple of years since because there are enough people who will pay that amount. And people in the industry say, actually, you could probably put it up to a thousand. And you still sell most of your permits. But it would make it unreachable for an awful lot of people to go and experience that. But that suddenly gave gorillas a monetary value. But gorilla tourism and, and the, the chimpanzee tourism, which has fallen as well, uh, the, there are definitely drawbacks to it. As a, it's not a, a system that can be applied everywhere. There probably aren't enough tourists to pay that sort of money for every population of apes to generate enough money to fund their conservation. So maybe mountain gorillas got lucky. They got in there first. They had a, an extraordinary woman looking after them, Diane Fossey, which is where I came into this whole story. Uh, when I first went to Rwanda in 1976, it was to work as Diane's assistant at the research centre. And at that time, gorilla trackers were basically farmers who Diane employed. They were often barefoot, but sometimes they'd get a second-hand pair of boots from one of the researchers that was leaving. They were wearing rags. I mean, they, they were their work clothes, so they obviously they don't put their 
has clothes on to go work in a forest because there's lots of thorns and you get very dirty and muddy. But it wasn't exactly a career. It was something that they did on the side to get a bit of extra money to supplement their farming. You go to Rwanda today, and this was a wonderful thing. During this, this year of guerrilla journey, one of the interviews I did was with one of the guerrilla guys, uh, Edward. And he was standing there in his uniform with his boots. And he's been doing it for 15, 20 years or so. He's a fairly wealthy guy. And surrounding him were little whites, boys from the surrounding villages. Now, in 1976, when I was walking up to the park, little lads were saying, can I help carry the bag? And I foolishly said, oh yes, that's very kind of you, thank you. And I was a bit surprised when they wanted money for it after this, because I was that green uh, in arriving in Africa for the first time. But now these little lads are looking at people like Edward and people like Tony. And their career aspiration is, I want to go to school, I want to be a guerrilla guy, or a guerrilla vet. And suddenly you've got guerrillas as being not just a, a mainstay of the national economy, not just a, a, an employer, but directly, but indirectly generating lots of jobs, but seeing uh, career paths for the next generation. And that really is quite inspiring. Because other kids just across the border in the DRC being brought up in armed rebel camps where their parents go out and kill people or mutilate people. They don't kill everybody, they just kill a few to terrorize because there are still armed militias living in the forest in the DRC, exploiting natural resources, mining, killing animals to feed their miners. Some of their miners are forced labor, some of them are there voluntarily to make money. But it's a very unsatisfactory state of affairs, and those kids are growing up in communities where violence and human rights abuses of making them weak are an everyday practice. That's what their parents do. And you see what sort of role models they're following as compared to the more inspiring ones in the better organized um, sites nearby. So poverty and ape conservation. <coughs> One of the things I'm trying to get across to people who see guerrilla tourism or chimpanzee tourism or potentially orangutan tourism, although it's never taken off in a big way, I have to say when I first brought tourists to Indonesia to see orangutans, because uh, I'm a trustee of the Orangutan Foundation in the UK, and uh, we came for the first time with the film crew to make a documentary about the work that we do there, um, but I then came with, with tourists and some of these tourists have actually been with me on, on trips in Africa to see um, gorillas and chimpanzees there. So they knew the kind of money you have to pay to get a ticket to see the Great Ape. When we get to Tanjungbuti National Park, and this was some years ago, I don't know what the current price is. Someone from Tanjungbuti, can you tell me how much a permit to go into the park and to see orangutans is now? Okay, so, so, so uh, and when I first went there with tourists, I think it worked out at about 20 pence. 30, 30 cents, one of which actually went to the commercial right of hands, went to the local government, to Jakarta. So, so even, even now, it, it is a world-class experience to walk through a rainforest, you see a big shaggy ape clapping through the trees, and, and I, I, I fear you are underselling it. So if, if you are working in one of these gorilla parks, your revenue receipts would be thousands of times more. And yet the experience is not that dissimilar. And the people who are really interested would pay more. So one of the things that we might discuss over the next two days is, is how the orangutan viewing experience could be made more special. What would make someone, in addition to the $7 that the, the regular tools pay, what could you offer them that would make them want to pay another $100? Personally escorted tour by one of your experts who can explain everything about right and both, that might do it. So some extra special thing. Because that way your, your parts would start to generate more and you might cover more of your costs and it might bring in a much different kind of tourism. So I think great ape tourism is never going to be mass tourism. You're never going to have busloads of people turning up to see apes. Having said that, um, there are places where that does happen, and I'm thinking of, of in, in summer, the second lot, the orangutan viewing is done in a, a small patch of forest which is stocked with really too many orangutans for the forest to support. So they are dependent on, on provisioning of food 
and every day the visitors pay a, a modest amount, um, I think a little more than $8, but nothing like as much as for gorilla viewing, uh, to stand on a boardwalk and look across at orangutans being fed. And for most people, that's fine. But even there, I'll bet that if you gave uh, an option of a $100 special tour, where the vet of the place or some other specialist talked about their work and what they were doing, people would pay that. Because the fascination for apes is part of the reason why we're here. But what I would like to stress is that even apes that are not being visited by tourists, therefore don't appear to have any monetary value, they are part of an ecosystem which now is being monetized. And whether it's through its ability to store and sequester uh, to store carbon, or whether it's through the rainfall generation, again, some people have seen the, the, the graphic as sometimes used of global rainfall patterns, where you can clearly see how the evapotranspiration in rainforests can drive the weather systems that water the rest of the world. And if you look at the, the way that, that uh, rainfall from <coughs> Africa comes across and joins the rainfall in Southeast Asia, and it goes across westwards across the Atlantic to join the Amazon. And it, it then sends off streams of rain across North America, watering the coal belt of the Midwest and across the Atlantic to Britain and Europe. Everywhere there are farmers dependent on rain, they should be considering how to protect tropical forests. And they're not. I often use wine as an example. You probably like a glass of wine if you're, if you're a drinker. Um, some of you may not be a drinker, but either way, if the, 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 the drink that you enjoy comes from a fruit, and it's a grape or a mango or a passion fruit, it depends on rain. And much of the world's water vapor is traveling in the atmosphere because of tropical rainforests. There are some Russian scientists who have been proposing this idea of the forest being a global pump, who, who people are talking about they should be getting a Nobel Prize for this concept that the rainforests of the world are pumping the water around the world. When we think of water, we almost invariably think of the liquid form. Or sometimes we worry about there's not enough of the frozen form because it's melting as temperatures rise. But it's water vapor, which is how most water moves around the world. And if you look at what the uh, evapotranspiration from tropical forests does, it pumps water into the atmosphere. In Oxford, uh, there's an organization called the Global Canopy Project. And they estimate that a square kilometer of tropical forest is pumping into the atmosphere eight to ten times the amount of water than a square kilometer of ocean. Just because an ocean has got one surface, even if it's a bit choppy, whereas a tropical forest has got trillions of leaves, each one of which has stomata, which is pumping out water vapor, and although rainforests receive a lot of rain, a lot of it stays up there and moves on to water neighboring areas. So both locally and globally, we owe a debt to tropical forests. And we're not paying that debt. We're reducing the area of forest and increasing the amount of CO2 that goes into the atmosphere. And that's why forests are so important to the carbon discussions and why I hope increasingly we recognize that the forests we're talking about include the apes. So in terms of bringing relief to poverty-stricken communities, if the money is going to come from northern industrial countries or companies as a, an offset against their greenhouse gas emissions because it's going to take them decades to change their top technology and move to a low-carbon uh, industrial future, then for a short window of opportunity, we have potentially billions of dollars which, if spent wisely, could help us to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, the targets that the, the world set itself to reduce poverty and improve health care and all and education and halt the loss of biodiversity. That's a huge potential. And one of the drawbacks is, of course, that whenever anyone starts talking about billions of dollars, it attracts people who are more interested in billions of dollars than they are in the goals of the the uh, people giving the money. And we're still seeing how the mechanism for red funding will go. And I hope that some of the people who've been working on these pilot projects for red, particularly if they're involving great habitat, 
will have something concrete to tell us. Because the hope was that there would be information from pilot projects some time ago. It's still very slow in, in coming. But we have a, an opportunity here. We have a room full of people, and interesting people from many walks of life and different communities, and I think different disciplines. There might be a rather strong emphasis on people who study primates, but there's lots of people who have other related skills. And they do say that if you throw a bunch of people, enough interesting people, into a room and give them all the typewriter, they could, by the end of it, write the works of Shakespeare. We're not asking for that. What we're asking for is policy guidelines. So if you, as a, as a group of people, put your heads together over the next few days, we could influence the course of policy. And if there's one thing that, that politicians need is, is advice. They don't always take it, but they do need it. So if we, as a group, can shape our ideas and give some clear indications, um, I would think this, this would have been a successful two days. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to sort of kick things off like this. I hope my ramblings haven't been too tedious and that some of the ideas that we've touched upon, defining poverty, um, the role of apes in forests, whether or not they've been visited by tourists. I didn't go into the big debate about the threats the tourists bring to apes. I'm sure the Tony will have something to say, and Admiral will have something to say about that during the next two days. Um, but I understand that, I, that we still have half an hour left, so I'd like to throw the floor open a little bit now and bounce some ideas around. Um, have any of the things that I've said or the stories I've told made you think rubbish? Or, oh yes, I can give an example of that. Because now would be a great time to chip in and make it less of a monologue and more of a multi log We've got a roving mic, haven't we? Two mics here. Thank you. Thank you very much for that nice presentation. What I've picked out is uh, the role of poverty in creative conservation and vice versa. The role of conservation also to poverty and mediation. Now, after having seen that, after having seen the role of conservation in poverty and mediation and the role of poverty in <laughs> okay, the other one, um, what do you think is the biggest problem? Why are we still having a, a challenge in conservation of great apes? Since we have seen that actually we can use <laughs> conservation to <laughs> address the poverty issues. What do you think is a problem? Why are we not there? I, I wasn't fortunate enough to be with the, uh, at the first workshop that was held to discuss this, but I understand that there was a clear distinction between countries that all the left all they have left is fragments of forest and perhaps they value those forests more because